Hey guys, what's up? Thank you so much for tuning in today here at Elevate Church. We know that today's message is going to rock your world and elevate your life to the next level. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the message. Lauren, how many know that you and I have an accuser of the brethren? And that's awesome that we have amazing Hollywood blockbusters, but for the next three weeks, we're going to bring meaning, beyond meaning of what Hollywood was saying, and I'm going to show you some things. The other liner was, it's not about deserve, it's about what you believe. Because how many know that we don't deserve the grace, the mercy, the forgiveness of God, but it's not about what we deserve, it's about believing that God, a Father who is so loving, so merciful, so graceful, has forgiven us and shown us and bestowed his love through his son. And today we're going to focus on identity. Look at your neighbor and say, who are you? Yeah, this is going to be really good today. Let's just break down this movie real quick, and then we're going to get right into uh, the points I have. Let's start with Zeus, a.k.a. in this movie is God. So he created beings in his image and strong and passionate, and he called his creation mankind, and man was good is what the script said right well check this out genesis 126 god said let us make man in our image according to our likeness let them have dominion over the fish of the sea over the birds of the air and over the cattle and over the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth and so we were created to be like our heavenly father so just kind of you know you look at hollywood and you know they're always kind of taking amazing stories from the bible and using them then you have aries aka the devil everybody say the devil aries was the god of destruction and his heart was to poison the hearts of men not only poison men's hearts but to literally get mankind to stop believing in their creator he turned them against god but he also turned them against themselves. And when you think about the scriptures, when you think about our adversary, our enemy, if you read in John 10, 10, it says this, the thief does not come except to steal. He comes to steal who you are. He comes to steal your true identity. He comes to kill. He comes to destroy. But look at this. Jesus says, but I have come that they may have life and that they have, may have it more abundantly. And so we have to understand that you have an enemy, an adversary, that does not want you to come to the fullness of who you are in Christ Jesus. And I really believe that as you think about this message today, I'm praying that I strike something in your heart, which I know I will. Then you got Diana, okay, a.k.a. Wonder Woman. Have you guys seen this, this movie? Yeah, okay. A.k.a. Wonder Woman. Okay, well, here you have Diana who is searching for the truth. She's searching for her identity as a matter of fact she is searching for the god killer like her whole life was defined on i need this god killer we know the god killer was what a sword right but the reality was she finally came to a place where she learned the truth that it wasn't the sword that had the power it was always her and we can totally identify with this type of story because I think that in our culture here today, many of us, we define our life of who we are based on what we do for a living. Like everything revolves around what we do. But how many know that that's the added blessing? What you get to do, let's say you're in business, you're a doctor, you're whatever, a lawyer, whatever it is that you do, it's so easy to fall in the trap of that becomes your identity. And without that, you're nobody. And that's, that's, see, that's, that's the enemy's trap. He wants to work overtime to get us to the place where we identify with what we do for a living. We identify with what we have in possession. We identify with all kinds of things. We identify with what people want us to be instead of what God has created us to become. And so it, it makes total sense. And so I have a very, very amazing point. Are you ready? The most powerful effective and driving thoughts that you will think in this life is what you think about yourself. Let me say that again. The most powerful, effective, and driving thoughts that you will think in this life, in this life, is what you think about yourself. And how many know that most of us spend our time thinking about what other, th other people think and not really thinking about what God thinks? 
Like we care more about the validation of man than we do about the validation of God. Proverbs chapter 23, 7 says this, For as he thinks or as she thinks in his or her heart, so is she, so is he. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. And so you need to know who you are, but most importantly, you need to know who you are in Christ Jesus. Because that's cool. You can begin to discover, I wonder what I was born to do. That's cool. Those are things you do, but it's not who you are. Okay? So go on the journey of discovering what you're called to do, but not at the expense of, at the expense of who you're called to be. That's like the most important thing. And so the truth is that God is never going to help you be anybody but yourself. And so many times we're praying to God to, you know, be someone else. Think about it. When we were children, when all of us were kids, we always wanted to be everything or, or someone else other than ourselves. Do you remember that? I mean, Dodgers, Fernando Valenzuela. Do you guys remember that, that pitcher? And just, I used to watch him and idolize him. I wish I was Fernando Valenzuela. I mean, I'm Mexican. Why can't I be? Fer because I'm not Fernando Valenzuela. I'm not him. And so as a kid, you want to be all, you want to be all other kinds of people. And so from very childhood, we're always looking to be someone other than who God called us to be. Unfortunately, today we have a world and a church that still thinks the same way. We want, we want every, we want to be someone that we were never called to be. So your identity comes from God. Say that with me. My identity comes from God. It doesn't come from the next best-selling book. It doesn't come from the next, you know, five steps. of No, it comes from God. Here's what 2 Corinthians 5.17 says. He says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a what? A new creation. In other words, you're new. You're brand new. There's something different about you. You're a new creation. Old things, former things broken things in you, the ugly things in you, right? The insecure things in you have passed away. Behold, and that word behold means get a hold of this. Like grasp this, embrace this truth. He says, have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And you know what? If you're not careful, you can simply just read the context and not understand or believe the fact that God wants you to take his word at face value. And it starts with believing in it. We need to believe that right now, even though you may not feel like you've manifested that new you, but you have to believe God. And I get it. So many times we can be so caught up with our past and, and our failures and our mistakes. And, and if you've been divorced and, 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 and if you were an alcoholic, a drug addict, and, and you lost years and you wasted time and you wasted. It's so easy just to caught, be caught up and, 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 and just like dwell in the past that you can't see that God has a better future for you. And that's the trap of the enemy. And we just wallow there. But right now, God said, it's in Christ that become, we become a new person. It's in Christ, in Jesus. And we, think, we have to think. We will see it if we start believing, but we need to first agree with God. If you think of, of Amos chapter 3, it says, how can two walk together lest they agree? So think about it. If you claim that you walk with God, but you're constantly struggling with who you are, then maybe it's not an issue that God's not listening to you. You're just not agreeing with God's word. We're too focused agreeing with what everybody else thinks, and that has become your worth, your value, your identity. And God said, no, if you, if you want to find you, you have to find me. You must come to me, and then I will make a new you. And what's cool about that is that you read the scriptures all throughout the Bible. God always has so much hope. He says, my mercies are fresh and new every morning. That means that today... You can make a change. Because I know this isn't just like, like for people that don't know God or are new to God. No, this is for the, the unbeliever, the baby believer, and the mature believer. Because I know a lot of mature believers that constantly, listen, here's the truth. We are facing in this culture that we live in, we have an epidemic issue of insecurity in our world. There are so many insecure people 
And no wonder when you live a life of in, insecurity, you're just not secure in who you are in Christ Jesus. We begin to take on the, 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 the mold and the form of what people think we should be. And then little by little, you start losing more and more of yourself. But it's in Christ. And I want to really emphasize this. Emphasize this. It's in Christ Jesus. It's in Jesus that I become a new me. Without Christ, I'm still the old me. With Christ, there's a new me. There's something new about what God wants to do in our life. So what do we do? We need to agree with God and not with what the spirit of this world thinks. Because this world already has a mindset, guys. The world already has a way. It has a culture, pop culture. It has a way of thinking. It has a way of believing. It has a way of living. It has a way of doing. It has a way of being. And God said, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Come on, let me help you and show you who you really are in me. That's what God wants, and there's peace in that realm. Because I have learned that when you don't know who you are or when you have moments where you're just kind of losing your identity, that's the most unfulfilling, unsatisfying, unhappy moments of our life. And we've all been there. In any period of your time walking with God, I don't care how much word you have in you, we all have moments of insecurity. i rather live in moments of insecurity than a lifestyle of insecurity. But there's too many people living a lifestyle of insecurity. And we need to graduate to moments. Amen? We need to learn how to exalt the word of God above all else. We exalt our, our weaknesses. We exalt our failures. We exalt our setbacks. We exalt, I mean, think. We're so consumed with us so often. When you're always thinking about you, you're insecure. When you're thinking about him, you're confident. In any season. So we got to learn to, to exalt God's word, exalt his, his life, exalt his purpose above everything else. And so the question is, well, how do I do that, Pastor? How do I do this? How do I, how do I find my true identity? Here's how you do it. You got to die. Look at your neighbor and say, you got to die. You got to die. You got to die. Let, let me explain to you. Galatians 2.20 says this. I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in this flesh, I live by what? I live by what? I live by faith in the Son of God. But most often, we don't live in the Son of God. We don't live by faith. We live in the flesh. That's the truth. We, we often spend more time in the flesh. Why? Because that's where we, that's where we live. This is my tent right now. My earthly tent is flesh. That's my earthly tent. And this flesh is always going to pull on me to draw away, to separate me from God's presence. That's what the enemy does to us. So the trap is always for God to separate us, not only from God, but to also turn against each other. That's why Jesus said, this is the way the world is going to know me, by how you love one another. So when there's hate, division, like the world has right now, a lot of hate in our world right now, isn't there? A lot of division. I mean, people get beat up because of stupid hats, stupid statements. I mean, we got the Republicans and the Democrats, and everybody's fighting. You know, God bless our country. God bless America. Yeah, but how about let's get the church to arise and to know who she is? Huh? What if more of us would stop being so focused and, and, and inner focused on all of our, our issues and, and also getting on the bandwagon of, of confusion and, and hate and, and opinions? And what if we allowed the word of God to actually govern our life? Because you know what? Here's the truth. You and I, we're not of this world. We may, we may live in it, but we're not of it. We're not of it. And so... There's, there's nothing that despises the devil more than a confident Christian. Man, when you're confident, when you know who you are in Christ, I'm telling you, the devil just can't stand that. As a matter of fact, he really doesn't look for confident Christians. He looks for insecure Christians. Those are the ones he always, he's always messing with. Why? Because he knows how to play their tune. He knows it. And I say all this because if, not, if you're not careful, you can be captured by pretense management. You know what I mean by that? In other words, we pretend to be something we're not. 
And that's exhausting, right? Pretending is exhausting. I mean, let me give you some examples. Like this week I was, you know, um, well, let me just say this. When you get exhausted in this pretentious management, just so you understand, it's when you pretend that you have it all together. Like everything's just amazing. But the reality is that nobody's life is amazing. We all have challenges, every single one of us, including myself. Okay, we pretend uh, you're someone you're not. We pretend that you have more than you really have. You pretend to be something you're not. And so we go through this life and we, we, we get this, this pretense management or this pre pretense strategy. And what I mean by that is, um, like, when we first started the church, I mean, it was, it was rough getting this, this, this church launched. It, it wasn't easy. But I remember when we finally got to, like, the 200 mark, 200 people attending Elevate. We started with 12, finally grew to 200. I would go to conferences, pastor conferences, just to develop myself and help myself and grow and, um, and just, you know, to give me some insight on, on how to do church. And listen, like your community where you work, the church also has a community too that gets, gets a little weird. And so, you know, I'll go to these conferences when I was, we're about 200 members, like I said, and we'd be in gatherings with a bunch of pastors. And, and there's always this, this question. It's uh, this. It goes like this. So, uh, How's your guys' church doing? AKA, how big is your church? That's what that really means. And it's like, dang. And I've, always, I've never liked the whole thing with, I mean, obviously, you know, God's going to add to his church daily. God's going to grow his church. But, it, but, but when, you're just, when you just identify with, with attendance, that, that kind of messes you up as a pastor. And so I remember being like, oh, here we go. And so I remember being in the circle, and this one guy's like, well, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. God has been so good. I'm like, I'm like, here it comes. We're 2,000 members strong, praise God. And uh, I'm just like, dang, I'm thinking in my head, dang, 2,200. I'm like, dang. So I'm just dreading for the moment to go around the circle and then get to me. Another guy goes, yeah, you know, God, God is awesome. He's just been so great. And, man, we're going strong. We're 500 strong. And we only started a month ago. And, you know, yeah, so you're just like, dang, you know, like, Okay, praise Jesus, you know, and, and, and I'm thinking, okay, in my mind, my thoughts are going, I'm thinking, right, I'm thinking, just say you have 400. <laughs> you know why? But, and, then, and then you start going scriptural, right? God said, and call those things that be not as though they were. So I started validating, like, well, God wants us to be 400. So just say, you got 400, right? I'm just thinking right in my head. I'm like, yes, I can, I can, yeah, I can say that because I believe it in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. <laughs> so they got to me like, how many do you have? I said, we got 2,000 members, praise God. No, I didn't say that. I didn't say that. <laughs> no, I said, we have 200 members. And they were like, oh. <laughs> and they ignored me after that. It was the most, like, hateful, hurtful wrongful if that's even a word thing like they literally just kind of like everybody just started talking to each other like you don't fit and so many of us we have this pretense management that we're constantly strategizing with just so that we can fit with a group of people that God has never called you to so many times we're just trying to fit into a crowd fit into a culture just so that you can feel better by yourself but God never called us to feel he called us to faith to have faith in Christ. It's no longer I who live, but I live in Christ. In Christ, in Jesus, is where I find the real me. That's how we do that. And this is, this is like a major, major issue that we constantly see in the church. There's so much pretense management. It's exhausting when you're just pretending that everything's good. And you can park there for a long time. Anyways, so I should have said 2,000. You would have treated me differently, praise God. <laughs> but here, here's what happens. There, there, there are too many people that just don't feel good about who they really are. That's the truth. I mean, just think about you. When you look at yourself in the mirror, what do you think about you? In all honesty, when you look at your life, when you look at your bank account, when you look at your cray-cray kids, when you look at your marriage, when you look at your job, 
What do you honestly think about that? Listen, there's a study that says over 80% of people are unhappy with what they do. Here's the truth. The reason people are, are unhappy with what they do is because they're unhappy with who they are. And so the only thing we do is we blame what we do so that we can make up for who we are. Because no one wants to look in the mirror and say, you know what? I'm really not in Christ. I'm really in me. I'm focused on me. I'm consumed with me. If you're constantly just consumed with you, your flaws, your mistakes, your sins, your which those are all obviously, you, we, we, there's repentance, there's forgiveness. But if you're just consumed with just everything that you haven't done, uh, you know, the person that you think you need to be and all these, that will exhaust you. And the enemy will use that against you and will wear you down. So what happens is, you know, people tend to feel the pressure of the world. The world today tells us what we should be, tells us how we should dress, tells us what we should have, tells us how we should look. I mean, think about it. There is this pressure of the world forming and shape. That's why God was clear, don't conform be transformed but then there's also the peer pressure the peer pressure of us thinking what others think that we should be that's peer pressure for example this week i was reading the news and this 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 30 year old girl 30 years old she had this peer pressure she had this mindset for for I don't know, maybe her teenage college year life, that she would have to be married with children by the age of 30. All her friends accomplished that except her. And so she commits suicide. That was this week. There is an epidemic identity crisis in the world, but also the church. See, you can be sitting in here clapping, singing, listening to a message and everything, but, but you're not in Christ. It's being in Jesus. It's knowing Jesus. It's being intimate with Jesus that we begin to find the true person that we are in Christ Jesus. That's where we find our fulfillment. That's where we find our happiness. You don't find it in a person. You find it in Jesus. Come on, you strive to go get with that guy. You strive to go get with that girl. Then you get and then you're bored. Because you thought that if I just have this, come on, you're starving for that car, you're working hard, you're, you're saving money, you get the car, then it's like, eh. So we constantly live with this unsatisfied soul that is always searching, but when we know Christ, we're no longer looking for these things to fulfill our hearts, to fulfill our minds, to fulfill our lives. We're looking for it in Jesus. And that's where we find the health in Jesus. Amen. Or we think I should have this kind of job to show people that I'm this important. A lot of people live that way. What do you do for a living? Well, praise God. You know, you know how that goes. Or I should, I should attend this type of university so that I can show people how smart I am. Parents, we're the worst at this. You know, we want our kids to be in Ivy League colleges, schools. We want you go to USC, son. You go to UCLA. You go all the UCs. Why? Because we don't want other parents to look at our kid going to COC. Yeah. I mean, or how about you put the, pre the peer pressure on your children. You're like, man, you better bring me home all A's. All A's. All A's. Since when does a letter define who you are or how intelligent you are? Our world has conformed us by letters, and we have literally adopted as parents without even knowing the same structure, the same system, and then we put the peer pressure on our kids and say, you better be an A student. You better be an A student. I was, listen, I failed in that area of my life. I used to do that in my kids, and they're, they're intelligent, smart. Isaac, Alexis was straight A's. Isaac, you know, he, he's intelligent. My son is brilliant. He's a smart guy, you know, but I remember telling him, man, straight A's, man, straight A's, and I finally said, you know what? I'm putting so much pressure on my son. And I just, I'm like, I said, here's the deal. Because he was a B student. I'm like, you know what? You just be the B, the best B student that you can be, man. Blow it up and be the best. Amen? And that was just so much freedom to him. 
freedom to me. But you know what we do as parents? We put the pressure, pressure and then you wonder why our kids break. Hmm? So there's, there's just too much pressure. Or how about this one? Um, I should go back to school because all my friends are doing it. That's so goofy. It, you know you suck as a student, but you want to go back because you want to look like the group. Are you, I, want to, I want to do what they do. Listen, no, do what God's called you to do and be faithful to that. Be focused, God. You know, and, 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 and here, here's the reality. What you do is, is the blessing. But who you are, that's the treasure. That's the treasure. That's where you find the greatest pearls in your life. It's not in what you do. What you do is awesome. Do, keep doing what you're doing. That's awesome. You know, go to find the jobs you like, do what you do. Like, for example, I'm a pastor. Okay, but it's not who I am. It's what I do. But sometimes, even in ministry, we can identify with what we do and not who we are in Jesus. Why? Because the world conforms us to think in different ways. That's why God says, my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. My ways are higher than your ways. He's reminding us in the scriptures to say, hey, listen, you need to, you need to come back to who I am in you and when you can do that then we can start seeing some really awesome breakthrough and um, it's a beautiful thing and what happens is sometimes because we're constantly in this pretense management we we get confused and we start because we're playing so many roles and you know you're 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 just constantly exhausted because you're just like okay i gotta put it together it's like you don't have to live that way and it just, it, it's, it's an epidemic. Insecurity is an epidemic. You need to be satisfied and fulfilled with, with the treasure that God has placed inside of you. Do that. And social media doesn't help, does it? I mean, it's a brutal thing. It's beautiful and brutal. Beautiful because you get to, you know, share your life, you know, with the world and especially your friends and things you do. But let me, let me be honest, a lot of that is pretense, man. It ain't for real. Last, I mean, think about it. It's funny. You start seeing pictures of everybody. You always see, like, man, they, they look like, oh, you look like a model. Oh, my. Yeah, girl, man, you put, like, ten slides in front of it. What do you call it? Filters, man. You know, and, and, and we can begin to vicariously live through social media. You know, we see someone in Hawaii, and they're, they're running like this, and you're looking at your spouse like, why aren't you taking us to Hawaii? Not realizing that maybe it took them a year to save to get to Hawaii because they worked hard. But what happens is we start looking visually at different people and we begin to crave what they have. You know, we, begin, we become jealous and, and we start, you know, coveting what they have and you want that and why don't you look like that and why don't you talk like that and why don't you eat like that and, why don't, and we get into this whole thing only at the expense of losing who you are. So social media is awesome. I like it. It's really cool. It is. It's, it's, a, it's a great tool. But that's all it is. It's a tool. Sometimes we identify with, with social media. We, how many likes do I have? We go back and check. Are we, you know, do they like us? Do they like us? It's like, but it's because we conform. That, that's, that's the truth. So the enemy is constantly working overtime. He's working overtime. You know why? Think about it. His greatest fear is that you actually find who you are in Christ. It's kind of like Diana, a.k.a. Wonder Woman. You know, she's in the middle of that battlefield on the scene. And everyone's going. You know, they're fighting. They're, 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 they're going for one year. They're like, they're just stuck in the same place for one year. They can't cross the German line. One year, she shows up. People are like, save me, help me. And she's looking at all this. And, and, and the people are pulling on her, please help me. And she's just like, what is, what is going on? See, when you're consumed with you, when you're stuck with you, you can't look up and see that there's a problem. You can't look and see that there are people that are hurting. When you're just so consumed with you, when was the last time you actually looked up and listened to someone? And so she's like, why aren't we doing something? She says, you know what, Diana, this isn't, we didn't come for this. This is not even our mission. She's like, are we just going to sit here and do nothing? And he's like, you know what? 
Yeah, well, we are doing some things, just like some of us Christians. Yeah, well, we are doing some things. I go to church. I, I read my Bible here and there. I, I, I lift my hands when the pastor says to lift my hands. I, you know, I do these things. That's not what God, God doesn't want a robot. He wants a relationship. And she said, well, if you're not going to do something, what's impossible for you is not impossible with God. And she, that girl gets up there and starts, bing, 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 right? Here's what happens. When you finally find who you are in Christ, you give other permission to be the best version of them. But when you're consumed with your junk in your trunk, no one gets changed. Not your children. Not your children. Not your family. Nobody changes. Why? Because God wants us to be in Him. And only in Him does everything else change. The scenery changes when we're in Him. The perception changes when we're in Him. And so we spend our whole lives worried and worried and stressed and consumed with our weaknesses. Is that not the truth? We, 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 listen, we are all guilty of that where you just consume with your weakness and, 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 and you know, uh, I'm not smart enough, I'm not strong enough. And, and we become these victims to Satan, the devil. We become his, 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 his little punching bag and he's called the accuser of the brethren in the Bible and he's always accusing us and we're sitting there just saying, well, yeah, he's right, I'm, I am a loser, you know? Yeah, I, I am no good. And, and, and we can stay there forever and I'm telling you, that's not the place that God created you to live or stay or camp or be stuck in. God wants us to arise and to begin to develop and to begin to strengthen and to begin to appreciate the person that you are in Christ Jesus. There is a treasure in you. A treasure in you. God wants you to find who you are in Him. And if you're not careful, you'll live the rest of your life wishing to have someone else's life and never experience the one that God gave you. You can be so wasteful, like Diana. She's wasting her life looking for the sword. Sword, God killer, slay them. And you saw the devil's like, shh. Aries is like, what you doing, girl? I have the God killer. Even the devil laughed at her. Girl, that ain't the God killer. You are. See, David got that revelation. He was the giant killer slayer. See, it wasn't the rock that took down Goliath. It was the God who was inside David that took Goliath down. And maybe you're searching, looking for something that's going to change my life. If I just have this, I'll be happy. No, you won't. You're not going to be happy. When you find Christ, when you're in Christ, that's where true joy, that's where everlasting love, that's where forgiveness and mercy and grace comes from. Outside of that, we're frustrated people. And that's where the enemy wants us. He wants us there. Because every minute that you spend wishing to be someone else, you are wasting the strength that God has placed in you to be and do something special. All of you are special. Every single one of you. Say it with me. I'm a giant killer. I ain't looking for man's validation. Yeah. You're not. We have to get to the point where we accept the treasure that God has given us, but also the dirt that comes with it. Because that's the problem, is that we're into the dirt, but we're not into the treasure. See, everyone here, we all got dirt. Everyone here, we all have a little bit of dirt. We're imperfect. Everyone here. You're not perfect, guys. I have to constantly remind the team, like, hey, because um, I'm going to be honest with you. I, I'm definitely not perfect. I, I can be rough-edged. Trust me, I, I'm, I'm, very, I'm very strong. Like, we, like, if you get hired here, you better handle me. Because if not, you, you won't make it. But just think about this. If I walked around trying to please our staff, our leaders... 
if I walked around trying to look for the validation of man, we wouldn't be here right now. Because I'm just trying to please everybody. Just, are you happy? Are you happy? Oh, are you happy? <laughs> don't leave, don't leave. Are you happy? Uh, no, I finally learned that God said he adds to the church daily. And when you finally cut off the, 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 the head of the snake of insecurity, of who's leaving you, who's staying, who's, when you cut all that out and you know who you are in Jesus, you're going to focus on what God has called you to do, and that's all I'm going to do. I, my job is to please God. Nowhere in the scripture to say, please all men. It says, but without faith, it is impossible to please God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is God and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Most people are, are unhappy because they don't diligently do anything for God. They don't buy into God's treasure. They buy in more into the dirt than the treasure. I'll show you. You don't believe me. Quickly, let's go. You guys doing good? So I tell my team, hey, listen, I'm not perfect, you know, um, but I love you. I'm here for you. I'm here to mold you. I'm here to push you. I'm here to, to get you stronger. I'm here to, to see you fulfill your call, and, and I'll do that. But I, you know, I'll never say, like, oh, I'm so easy to work with. I ain't easy to work for. You kidding me? But neither are you. You ain't easy to live with. I'm sure. I'm sure if we hung around your house, I'd be like, oh, I'd be like, you weird. But, but the truth is that people stop serving God because they won't buy into God's treasure. Look, Matthew 13, 44 through 46 says this. The kingdom of heaven is like what? Hidden in a what? Field. How many know that? You Say, I'm God's field. So check this out. So the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. I'm the field of God. And when a man found it, and when a man what? Found it. He hid it again, and then his, in his joy went and sold all he had and bought that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When, when found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had, and he bought it. Let me tell you something. This is amazing. Because you know what? You look at this, and you're thinking, okay, why is it that I can't buy into God's treasure? We, we get into buying dirt instead of buying into the treasure that God is saying. God's saying, I am your treasure. You are my pearls. You are, I'll give you the pearl of wisdom. I'll give you the pearl of joy, the pearl of peace, the pearl of insight, the pearl of understanding. I'll give you the pearl of faith. It's only in Christ. We buy lands, but we buy dirt. God says, I want you to start digging the wells of treasure because how many know that that the dirt the dirt does not cancel the treasure and so many times we see dirt I, listen it's easy to pull dirt out on anybody it's hard to pull out the gold but God sees the gold in you God wants us to get to the place of knowing that we are his treasure that means that in my dirt Think about it. He says, he says, the man went to a field and he dug for treasure and he bought it. That means that you got to come to the place where you have to stop compromising and selling out to your own ideas, to your own ideologies, to your own ways of thinking, your own ways of being, and start buying into the treasure that God has. The man found it. Woo, joy. There's joy when you find out who you are in Christ. He was like, yeah, man, he went away. He says he sold it all. He sold his insecurity. He sold his lack of faith. He sold his fear. He sold his anxiety. He sold everything. He says, oh, I want this. So dirt does not discount the treasure. You know what, you know what dirt does? The dirt is what helps you actually discover the pearls of your treasure. Every single setback, every single fallout, every single sin, every single broken place of your life, God will take what the devil meant for bad, and he'll give you a pearl. A pearl. Look at your neighbor and say, you ain't that bad after all. Listen, Mark Twain, listen. 
Mark Twain said this. He said, there are two great days in a person's life. The day we are born and the day we discover why. Two great days. Most of us don't know why. Most. But today you can be back in Christ and you can begin to find the real person in Jesus. I'm going to give you this quick survey. Who are you? Here's an identity test. Look at this. Number one. Here's the question. We're going to check ourselves before we wreck ourselves. I often see myself as a victim of my circumstances. True or false? Nick. It's false, Joseph declared to his brothers who had sold him as a slave that what they meant for evil, God meant for good. Come on, God will turn your dirt into a treasure. God will turn your dirt into pearls. Number two, quickly, guys, I feel that no one has ever really loved me or cared about me. True or false? God has already demonstrated his love for us by sending Jesus, his son, to die for us. Next one. Other people have kept me from being what God would have me to be. True or false? Well, of course, it's false. If God be for us, no one can stand against us. Next one. Other people may, ha- may hear God speak to them, but I never hear God speak to me. False. Every believer has the capacity to hear the voice of God and to obey his voice. Next one, five. I look at myself and question if God could ever use me. Well, we know, we, I know we're saying a lot of false. We're saying all the right answers, but we're living all the... If God can use a donkey, <laughs> he can use anyone. Say praise God to that one. Amen. Number six, I often get angry when people question what I know to be right. <laughs> false. When we, don't, <laughs> when we don't know who we are, We feel that we have to defend ourselves. Jesus, our example, stood in silence before Pilate. He said, I don't got to talk to you. I know who I am. And I know my mission, and I know my purpose, and I know my father. Amen. My success is based upon becoming debt-free and wealthy. Let me tell you something. This is a big trap now in the church. People are hoarding, in, like Christians, hoarding, like save. We, we, we twist. We have all these wonderful things, which we do here as well, like Peace University, get out of debt. But sometimes at the expense of being greedy. And you just, you just oh, hoard it, save, save, save. And then you lose that sense of generosity. It's such, it's such a big trap. So look at this. False. God measures success based solely upon hearing and obeying his voice. Go back, please, guys. It ain't finished. What is greater than hearing and obeying the voice of God? There's nothing greater. Nothing. There's not enough money on the earth that can pay me or or make me happy than obeying the voice of God. Amen. When you start obeying the voice of God, you're going to find true joy. I I promise you, you will. Next one. The major cause of feelings of inferiority is my seeing my imperfections. True or false? Well, it's true, right? But it's false, right? The major cause for feeling inferiority is comparing our lives with others. I was like, you know, always comparing yourself. Well, how come I don't, you know, have her hair? How come I don't have his looks? How come I don't have his physique? You know what I'm saying? Like when I'm watching soccer, I can sit there at the TV and be like, you know, like I want to go play. Like, God, why didn't you give me like soccer legs? You know what I'm saying? So I can, you know, you know, I have to, I have to embrace. I have to embrace what he gave me and be happy with that. Number nine, I am thankful to God in every situation. Well, it should be true, but it, it's not. Shh. It says, it is God's will for us to give thanks in every situation. In every situation. Do we always do that? So that's a good identity test to ask yourself. Man, did I, did I have a lot of, lot of signs showing that I actually do have an identity crisis going on in my life? Well, guess what? can go back to Jesus. Go back to your first love and watch what he'll do. He'll start giving you the confidence that you need. Amen. If today's message impacted you in any way and you want to help us spread the gospel with a financial gift, text the number below and we know that someone's life will be changed the same way that yours was today.